I will say that the downside to specs grading is I probably spend more time grading than I did before because I have made the choice that I would rather allow students to have redos to show that they understand. And the trouble is it's confounded, right? I'm doing this in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. So I do feel a strong need to have far more compassion for their mistakes, for their needing delays, for my mistakes, right? Like I predict that probably if you were to do a, you know, sample of my teaching, it may not be as strong because I am also fatigued and tired by all of this. You just heard Marianne Lloyd from Seton Hall University in South Orange, New Jersey. My podcast partner, Garth Neufeld, interviewed Marianne for episode number 142 of Psych Sessions, Conversations About Teaching and Stuff. Stay tuned for so much more. The Psych Sessions podcast is brought to you by Macmillan Learning. Introducing Macmillan Learning's Achieve for Psychology, setting a whole new standard for integrating assessments, activities, and analytics into your teaching. Achieve for Psychology helps instructors measure and guide students' progress through a wide range of assessments, including pre-built summative practice quizzes, quizzes drawn from a robust test bank, and learning curve, adaptive quizzing. And only Macmillan's Achieve offers assessment in every single interactive feature and video activity. For a preview of Achieve and examples of its multiple assessment opportunities, go to macmillanlearning.com forward slash psych sessions. Listeners, we want to invite you to be among the first to know who and what's coming up on the Psych Sessions podcast. Join our opt-in email list, just like hundreds of psychology instructors have already done. We promise not to fill your inboxes. When we email you bi-weekly or monthly, it will be something that means something. From new series announcements to new opportunities, we invite you to join the mission to get free, high-quality professional development to all teachers of psychology. So sign up for our opt-in email list. Just go to bit.ly forward slash psych sessions dash email. That's all lowercase B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash psych sessions dash email. It's so good to All see right. you. Can you hear me yet? No. This is this is this is the pro, Marianne Lloyd. Hello. <laughs> What's going on? It's nice to see you. Gosh, it's been a while. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I got us recording already. So That's fine. What's going not... on? What's going on in this room? It looks like it's my like... child's room. Is it? Yes. Because oh my gosh. Rob has, I didn't, in case we were not right, right on time, Rob has an interview for promotion at three o'clock. So he wants the office office. So it was what's sit in the purple thing? room. What are you, what's going on ahead? Above it's your a head? Date, it's a uh, loft bed. So it's what's like, a there's like a desk bed? at the bottom and then there's like a ladder. Oh, which you probably can't see because the sunshine. And then yeah. this is her bed. Oh, because that's she awesome. has, we have like your standards, 1920s colonial, which has two, you know, regular which would be called tiny by mcmansion style bedrooms and then like a nursery size room but yeah yeah Yeah. my kid uh when she they're they're about the same age i think right so when when she got rid of her bed what did you call that kind of bed the one with the loft bed a loft bed when she got rid of hers now it wasn't this big but when she got rid of hers i was like okay i don't know where all your stuff's gonna go so now we just live in chaos that's just what we do oh we live in chaos also we we have a loft and chaos so the loft doesn't save you from half my life is just trying to just clean up the chaos and then it just pushes back in yeah yeah (laughs) yeah you're fighting a battle that you won't win need to embrace the chaos become clutter blind i know and didn't you move am i making this up about you i move well and i should tell everybody who's listening that and you that what you're going to hear is hammers right now uh, because we're doing it we're in the middle of an addition which is a 
you know, low stress thing to do during a pandemic. Yeah, it's a great idea. You yeah. should have as many strangers in your house as possible asking you questions when you're fatigued. I know. And then they should be wrong like 10% of the time. And oh, then, God. yeah, that's good too. But, um, you know, uh, all, all things considered, Marianne, we're here and we are, we're exactly. talking. <laughs> we are talking. It's working. <laughs> My internet connection has not been st- unstable yet. So that's right. That's right. So it's good to, uh, it's good to hear your voice, uh, not on ask psych sessions. I mean, it's good to hear it on ask psych, psych sessions, but now I'm like looking at you. I'm very familiar with this voice. <laughs> Do you feel like this is like a thing you do now? This ask psych sessions thing? Is it like a, is it feeling very like, like second nature to you now? Oh yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. like looking through my, uh, my spreadsheet. It's like when I meet people, I think, hmm, would I like to talk to you about your teaching? <laughs> <laughs> or not. Right. <laughs> By the way, what's going on with your mic stand here? Cause I'm just, we're looking it, around your mic stand. Is it wobbly? No, it's not wobbly. I just oh, can't so see your I face. Could do... Oh yeah. There oh, we go. okay. Now I can see, see your face. Look at yeah. that. Good. Good. Uh, are you looking through your mic stand at your guests on ask psych sessions? Probably. <laughs> well, it sounds great. So, well, and I don't, uh, you know, like I'm such a tiny picture. So yeah, I guess I'm uh, their picture looks fine. I never pay attention to what my pictures. Look oh, like. fine. Yeah, it's great. And we only started video. It feels like five minutes ago, which I know is not true on Zencaster because no, I'm still hanging out on Zencaster. Oh, are you really? Yeah. Is that how you're recording them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think I got lazy. I think I'm now like I'm zooming. Although I was just at Nightop and I think I did five face-to-face interviews. Oh, that's so exciting. It was fun to be back in person. I yes. People won't understand like hmm, people. They'll understand it. People will understand it, but they may not understand it. People who are like, can you just do psych sessions through Zoom? It seems like it's a fine way to do it or through Zencaster don't understand, but they do, but they don't understand that it's just, there's a different energy in person. It's like teaching in person, right? Yes. Yeah. It's, I was um, back in the classroom for the first time in like, what a year and nine months um, this week. And it was, it was electric. Yes. It was fun. Have you been? Yes, we were in person last semester. We've been back in person. I had a sabbatical fall 2020. So I've been back one semester. We are online for the first week and a half for now, but I assume yep. we'll go back IRL. What was that like to go back? It was great. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's far my, my preference by far. Right. Um, who are you? Are you working mostly with undergraduate or graduate students? I can't remember. Almost all undergrad. Yeah, we do. We have a small and closing graduate program in experimental psych. So, okay, it's going to only be undergrad soon. What are you teaching right now? Uh, I we start next Wednesday. I'll have two sections of research methods and our lab research experience class, which was meant to sort of standardize what students working in faculty labs are doing. So half their grade comes from what they do over there. And then we have professional development, presentations, that sort of like a weekly class that does that stuff. It's a fun one to teach. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. I, uh, when I first got handed a research methods course, uh, like 10 years ago, it was like, I think my colleague, Michelle member at the time was, she was like kind of burned out on it. And so it only got taught once a year at the community college. And so she was like, do you want to try it? And I, I, I was scared, but I knew it was like something that I needed to do. I don't come out of a strong research background. So um, it was a real struggle as any new prep is. But now 10 years later, more than that, maybe it's my absolute favorite course to teach. I love oh, yeah. it. Yeah. Right. It's, a, it's so fun. And there's so just you can make choices constantly about where you want to focus and bring in contemporary conversations. And it's, you know, I like the classes that students dread and then aren't as bad at the end, right? They get to have that upswing. That's the truth in that course. And I'm, I tell them that exact, exactly that from the first day. Um, what is your, like, is your research methods like a second year course or mostly third year mostly third. juniors okay yeah so they take you know if they come in as a psych major they would probably do intro their first year stats their second year and methods their third year and then it's also often a third year class because we have lots of students that 
get into psychology after other majors. And so, you know, they come in at the end of sophomore at the beginning of junior year. Okay. Do you like that stats uh, method sequence in that order? <laughs> By the way, I know there's no right answer. I've been talking about I people. Know. Yeah. I, I mean, it's not practical, but I think the dream would be to get to keep, to combine them and to keep everyone for a year. But we have a Bachelor of Science degree option and they don't have to take stats. They can take a mathematics based statistics class. So it's practically this, implausible. This is, this is psych stats specifically. Psych stats. Yeah, we teach our own in house yeah, psych yeah. stats class. Yeah, this, uh, the students who have had stats in my research methods course, there's always a couple. So, my, like right now, I think I have 20 students in that methods course. And then a couple of them have stats and I know that they will excel because it will click for them. Like a lot of the things that we are talking about are going to click, but uh, I've talked to enough people that I know the inverse is true too, that when now, right. when these students take a stats course, it's going yeah. to click in a different way. Right. So yeah. Yeah. It's like painting the whole picture or whatever, I or I don't know. Yeah. So, Hey, it's good. It's good. Now is that, is that one of your favorite classes to teach? What do you like to teach? I think that is my favorite class to teach is is research methods. And yeah, I think not just because it. <clears throat> excuse me, is you know I think this is the. If you ignore my sabbatical semester, it's been every semester since spring of 2018. Um, wow, that it is a one or two sections, so it is my. You know, it is my bread and butter. Yeah, of my career. Yeah. yeah, and when you teach a class that many times in a row, you can really change it incrementally in ways I think that are helpful. Yeah, um, I think, and yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say an add and change things, right? So it was not, I transitioned to specifications grading in it last spring because I felt so comfortable with the material that it felt fine to have that in. I haven't taught undergrad COG since 2010. So if I, when I get to teach that again, right? I'm not sure, you know, some of that content yeah. is yeah, going to be not so fresh. That's your area, right? Uh, yes, but yeah. it's you know it's a big it's a big yeah. umbrella, and uh, I do yeah. a little, you know. Okay, I need to talk to you about research method specifications grading. Okay, so okay, uh, but before we get to that, because guess what? I just finished a book, faculty book circle today, and guess what? Uh -huh. We were reading like right twenty minutes before I was on the call with you. We finished uh, up chapter eight on this about motivation uh, yeah. in specifications grading, and in fact. Linda Nilsson is going to come talk to our faculty. Um, she's been kind enough to donate an hour to just come talk to our oh. faculty book circle, which is fun. Um, but before we get to that, your research methods class, are they actively doing research or because, uh, and I'll just say that in my course, they are maybe doing like, they're doing a simple survey assignment, but it's simple, simple at the end. But really I am, I am trying to give them the whole the whole landscape of research methods. So we're covering most of the chapters in a typical textbook for research methods, but how do you approach it? Yeah, same, very consumer oriented approach, right? So I use uh, Beth Morling's book and uh, most of our students are going to not become PhDs and researchers themselves. So I'm far more concerned with their ability to read a journal article and apply it to concepts or to read a write-up of a journal article and find concepts in there. Students that would like to earn an A in the course for specifications grading, they do an additional lab report and they do come up with something. Most of them choose to do a pretty simple survey, but that still gives them a chance to think about how you pull out your data, analyze it. And uh, I use Jamovi for stats analysis. Okay. But I'm far more interested in interpretation and thinking than I am in study creation. Right. So you are having them, well, because they've taken stats, so you can have them do some of that. So yeah, I draw that line pretty firmly of not getting into any of the st stats side. Yeah. And so yeah, everybody has to figure, I, I, I think that everybody has to figure out where they draw that line. I draw that line of like kind of understanding, of, like having an understanding about what inferential and descriptive uh, mm -hmm. statistics are, but really not diving into that. So hopefully it's a, you know, it's a solid foundation for, um, for when they do take stats, but okay. So, all right. So specifications grading, I know you've interviewed at least one person about it, right? Like two and uh, three, because I had two guests at the second oh, one. So okay. Yes. Early on Erica Knowles, 
from the Berkeley College of Music. Yes. And then I chatted with Ellen Carpenter from Virginia Commonwealth and Katie Ann Scottsburg from Center College. Were you already flirting with the idea of spec grading when you talked to them? Like, is, is Ask Psych Sessions just a working out of your own pedagogy? <laughs> exactly. It's a, it's a working out of how I can't do everything. Um, so, yeah, when I talked to Erica, I had not tried it. And then mm-hmm. when I spoke to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Katie Ann and Ellen, um, yes, we had finished. Uh, I had finished my first semester with it. And those two are very active on a Slack group about specifications grading, which is why I asked them if they would be willing to come and chat. Okay. Okay. So I think they did the ACT presentation on it too in October. Yeah. I did not see that. I wonder if it, I'm sure it's recorded because they were right. Those things were recorded. (laughs) So I got to go back and check that out. But anyway, um, yeah, I want to talk about ask questions here because I mean, there's just so much good information that comes out of that. Um, you know, it's so different because uh, on the like the flagship psych sessions, we go wherever. So if somebody does have a research area or whatever, we might touch on it. But um, here for Ask psych, psych Sessions, you are really targeting like we are going to learn about spec grading. That's what we're going to talk about here. And, um, and so you really get far in that. But OK, tell me about how did it change the way that you approached your teaching or specifically your methods class. So what I liked about it was it forced me to be really deliberate about what I thought was essential for students. This is our prerequisite to their senior seminar and to make sure that students could achieve that. But then it also really led me to just giving more time and space for people that need more time in space to understand things. So I, I will say that the downside to specs grading is I probably spend more time grading than I did before because I have made the choice that I would rather allow students to have redos to show that they understand than, you know, you turned it in, you got kind of a partial credit grade and we're just going to move along, right? But, I much but prefer on the, uh, holding them accountable to this, meeting specifications. I allow so- a lot of redos, probably more than some people might. Which she calls tokens. In tokens. The- I do call them tokens and we oh, have chances do? to own them. And the trouble is it's confounded, right? I'm doing this in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. So I do feel a strong need to have far more compassion for their mistakes, for their needing delays, for my mistakes, right? Like I predict that probably if you were to do a you know, sample of my teaching, it may not be as strong because I am also fatigued and tired by all of this. So... Um, Yeah. So I think that's the big thing. And then it's, you know, I like the piece where students have a say in how much they want to do for a grade. And you can set up a class so that they can not necessarily, you know, do I have journal responses, right? They don't need to do all of the journal responses uh, to earn a B in the course. But there's going to be a question on the celebration of learning slash exam about each journal article. So they still need to... Celebration of learning. (laughs) Thank you, Dr. Hunter, who gave me that term to use. Um, Yeah, so it's not... You know, I think some people think, well, students just aren't going to blank. And I think you can structure the class so that not everyone needs to be at the level of the person that loves methods so much that they're going to spend their lives teaching it, right? Hopefully you get a couple of those every semester, but that's not... You know, students are also... They have rich, full lives. So I think it's helped me to be uh, just m- much more deliberate and think about also what is, a, what is a line for what's enough. And for an exam, I say it's an 80%. If you can get an 80% on the exam, I consider that credit. You get a little count in your tally mark for exams. Okay. And then if they get all those, I mean, do you guys use letter grades at your institution we do. Mm-hmm. okay so really are you saying that turns into an a in the end that's an a they have to so the way i set it up is they have to get a certain number of each item in the course so there's uh, the online chapter quizzes journal article responses i use socio-emotional learning exercises lab papers accumulate a final that everyone needs to successfully complete I think those are all the pieces. Um, and so the higher grades require more of each of those items. So someone that gets an A yeah. needs to have passed all three mm-hmm. celebrations of learning. Someone yep. that's going to earn, chooses to earn a C, they only need to pass one. But they're yep. going to need some of that stuff to pass the cumulative final. Right. So where the uh, really, really, really important stuff is. Yeah. So to get an A in your course does not mean being perfect. 
not or without at all. error. Yeah. Nope. Nope. Yeah. You can be 80% on every chapter quiz for things like the journal responses. I am picky. Yeah. And you can't misuse terms. And that's why you have redo tokens, right? So you can't say this is an association claim when it's set up as a causal claim. But that's fine because it's not like you make that mistake and you can't go back and fix it because I care about understanding. Yeah. How can you? So the subtitle of the book, uh, it, one of the things it says is saving faculty time. That's not your experience, though. So what are you what are you doing wrong, Marianne? <laughs> I, I think I'm doing it in a pandemic, right? This book was not written during a pandemic. And I no. probably I mean, I think that's one thing. But I also think that I maybe haven't scaffolded enough. So I am putting in more scaffolding next semester. So yep. for when they turn in a lab paper, they also need to turn in kind of an assessment that says, you know, here are the pieces, here's the specifications. Tell me on which page you have done all of these items. Yeah. And for the journal responses, it's a four part piece. Now I'm just putting a model in that the one where they get into trouble is that a, the third section requires them to relate what's in the journal article to six things that are from the textbook or from our class time. And sometimes they only do four. Well, now there are six, the numbers one through six are listed right there. Right. right? So right. Yeah, there needs no, to we, be stuff in all yeah. six of those. So I think that is part of it, right? I am, you well, know, you don't know until first you don't. time. You didn't yeah. know what you, yeah, of course, of course. And so that's just like the the growth, but no, it's cool. Uh, I've been, I've been kind of sprinkling it into my courses and I think, I think that I might go full on. We'll see. I'm coming. I'm, I'm hopefully going to have a sabbatical next year. I'm applying for it. And so that'd be one of the things I'd like to do is um, kind of, mess around with spec grading a little more intentionally um and especially and the scaffolding stuff takes time to to put in and yeah i don't know yeah because when they just get a grade and they accept it then it doesn't force you to think about how you could have done the assignment better whereas when they're coming back because they want to earn credit that gives you more chances there's a really great article uh that just came out uh, that sort of is like a map for like should what are the risk factors like who's in really good shape to do it and who's in less good shape and one of the things that makes specs more appealing is if you're teaching material that you are already super familiar and comfortable with and it's maybe not the best idea for stuff that you're not feeling a solid on mm -hmm. and it's better if you know you have tenure or a lot of job security it's not as good if maybe you don't it's great if you're in a department that encourages teaching innovation maybe yep. less great yep. otherwise so that's that's a helpful i think roadmap too okay talk to me about students are you telling me that students look at your do you have an a b and c option in your in your i have a a minus b plus b b minus oh, c plus c sake. c minus d plus d and they get to choose yeah and i they... mean they need a c minus or higher for methods to go on to and seminar. What if they say now? Do they choose up front? No. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So they're not like. I think the way that Nilsson talks about it is that you choose which track you're going to go on, and then maybe that is something you do internally, right? You look at these options and you choose. Do you talk about that at the beginning of the course? I do. I talk about it um, a lot, and I also talk about the ways that they, you know, have opportunities to shift and and change. I mean, one thing that I have to do a better job with is helping them feel more confident that they'll have enough tokens to be okay. And that part of why they may not get credit early on is because they're getting used to me and my expectations. Yeah. And so, and they're getting used in this class to reading a lot of journal articles, right? By the ninth journal article, they're all doing really great, but that's partly because they've read eight other journal articles that's plus right. articles for their lab paper. And things yeah. get better when you practice. So, um, some students, they get paranoid. And so then they hoard tokens early on because they're worried they'll need them, you know, like, well, what if the cumulative final is a total disaster, even though I try to present statistics about how it's not, but they're like, well, maybe I need to save four tokens because I can't pass the class without it. And it's like, well, that's not really the goal of the cumulative final. The goal, I tell them, the goal of the cumulative final is so that when you're in senior seminar with one of my colleagues, who's also a friend, they aren't like, did you forget to teach in methods? Yeah. <laughs> because I have some concerns about the the base information. Yeah. Your cumulative final is, uh, is, there, is there a token option for that? So anything uh, that they are doing for the first time, they automatically get two redos. Um, so, and I consider the cumulative final to be separate from the other celebrations of learning. So there's even some built-in flexibility there. Because my thought is that, you know, the first time I, I don't want to just do two because sometimes the second time if my feedback isn't super clear, 
and students, yep. you know, some of them are more and less willing to ask clarifying questions. Man, it, it I is, want them to then have that third. It's the ideal way to teach. It really is. If if you can figure out that workload piece, uh, because it. Yep. Can you hear me? I lost audio, but you're back. Okay. Are you, you were, still there? I am still here. Yeah, but I've moved to unstable. All right. Okay. Is this is this because uh, your husband is um, online right now? Who knows? You know, you cursed it at the beginning when you said our internet has been stable. That's right. I think you said that maybe verbatim. So, <laughs> okay. I don't remember what question I was asking, but anyway, thank you for indulging me about specifications grading. Um, so, you know, I guess we could, I, I kind of want to talk about ask psych sessions, but is there anything else that you've been up to during this pandemic? Cause it's been a long time since you've been uh, on the podcast like this in this way. I mean, just 16 months, but they were like a long 16 months. That right? was a long Wasn't 16 it? months. Yeah. Did you re-listen to our conversation before we I did talked not. Today? Me either. Okay. No. I thought, so I, I, I might repeat stories. Well, listeners. I pegged you as maybe somebody who would do that, but no. I, hmm, yes, there, are, that is not an unfair disposition um, <laughs> accusation, but <laughs> What won instead of doing that was, you know, an accreditation standards committee meeting and a uh, meeting about our degree work software implementation. Wow. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, so what have you uh, what are you listening to podcast wise these days? Are you uh, are you, have you have you given up on that or are you still an oh. avid listener? <laughs> no, no, I'm. <laughs> I'm an avid 1.5 speed listener. Um, would you like to know by day my preferred show? I, I would. And by the way, I'm I'm with you now. And I'm talking 1.75 audiobooks oh. up to 2.0. Also 2.0 on the audiobook. Audiobooks yeah. are slow, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, I get that that might help me absorb into them, but I then I become impatient. I do. Yeah. If I am doing a jigsaw puzzle while listening to an audiobook, sometimes I have to slow down a little bit because <laughs> I won't be paying enough attention. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, then, then do you find after listening to audiobooks on 2.0 that the world's just too slow? If I try to then, yeah, right. Like be with things that are existing at a proper pace. I mean, I do while doing it, I, I acknowledge that this is not living in you know, it's not living a mindful life, right? Like being patient, being 100%. present. But we we listen to these things fast so that we do make the space to be mindful, right? Later, That's right? Right? More That's space right. for mindfulness. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Mindfulness is for the afternoon. By day. By day. So or whatever. What are you listening to? Monday, I listened to Sarah Hart Unger's Best Laid Plans podcast, which is about planners planning and planning adjacent topics, um, because I. I don't know. I just enjoy like a good niche. Like I have a planner, but I don't, I don't have any of the accessories or anything, but the idea of listening to other people's enthusiasm, I don't always get to a Badir, Hank and John, uh, the green brothers, they have their, you know, kind of listener question show. I know it's often what, funny and, what's and quirky. It about? whatever people write in about, like, what should I do about the situation with my roommate? What is your favorite kind of potato chip? Like what? So John Green and Hank Green are both authors. I think John's a little more well-known like turtles all the way down. And the other one I can't think of right now, the Alaska one. Um, Tuesdays, the Another Mother Runner podcast, Psych Sessions, usually releases something on every other Tuesday, a long form. Um, Wednesdays, I like Happier with Gretchen Rubin. Thursdays, the spinoff show Happier in Hollywood, Not Your Average Runner, which is high for swearing. I should warn people if they're going to download that. Not Your uh, Average Runner is about running? It's about running. Oh. Yep. yep. Uh, inclusive running specifically, right? So not like track superstar running, like oh. people of you know older ages, larger sizes, things like that. Um, yep. uh, but mostly about like the mental piece, which is translatable across lots of things. And by the book podcast, which is one of my favorites, which are people living by self-help books in two-week intervals. Friday is also another Mother Runner. Oh, Thursday, Reply All, when they have new episodes. Code Switch, I think, is a Thursday release. Still processing. They've been on hiatus. I think those are the ones that... Oh, oh, um, 
The Slowdown, which puts out a poem almost every day. That's a good one to listen to in just a few minutes. That's one where I really feel like I should not be listening to this on <laughs> sped up intervals. <laughs> but you do. But I do because I'd have to unlock my phone and change the speed. Right. Yeah. Um, and then that made a different one fall out of my brain that I that I'm a regular listener to. Um, yeah. Oh, Family Secrets, uh, oh. which is uh, her memoir. Um, was about finding out through genetic testing that her, uh, you know, her father was not her biological father. Um, and so now she interviews people often who have written memoirs that have, as she says, you know, the secrets we keep, keep people keep from us, the secrets we keep from them, the secrets we even keep from ourselves. And those are often very compelling yeah. interviews. Uh, where are you finding the time? I know because it's fast, it's less time, but where are you finding the time to do this? Do you have a routine, a daily routine? Or? Yeah. So I have waterproof headphones. So I listen in the shower. I listen if I'm exercising by myself, which isn't often my running partner lives across the street. Um, I listen like on my short commute to and from work. I'll listen if I'm cooking. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say any, any time if, if it's really simple data analysis, like I'm just downloading spreadsheets and you know, cutting, pasting, merging, I'll do it then as well. Okay. Yeah. It's, but I don't, I should say I, that's the media that I consume. I do not watch shows. Like if anyone starts a question with, have you watched? Unless the answer is Encanto, which we watched as family this weekend. Yep. No, no, yep. no Ted Lasso, no Shit's Creek, no succession. No, I listen to shows where oh. people tell me about what happens in those shows. Oh my god. So goodness. I'm culturally aware, the, but I don't know what's happening. The last episode of succession season three, just for any listeners out there. Oh my gosh. And that's it. Okay. But for succession, now I need to say this as well. I'm sorry. You have to push through the first few episodes. You have to. I tried it twice before I could get into it. And then it was, um, but you know what? If you, know, if, if you don't like things that make you anxious or depressed about humanity, probably don't watch it because it's, it's an awful, these are awful people. So, um, but I love succession. So, and see, um, I cannot handle that. I, would score very highly on any kind of absorption scale. Like it is. Yeah. It, it all feels very real to me. So I, that does not feel enjoyable to me. Any, okay. Anymore. So I said, yeah, like I know what an absorption scale is, but is that a scale that we actually have? So it is a scale. This is like where I should ask is when you have secondary knowledge. So uh, Steve Lynn was a clinical psychologist in my program. I was friends with some of his grad students. And so it was a predictor of whether or not people would think they were, would be hypnotizable was their level of absorption. And this is sort of like when you're watching a movie, does it really feel, that's the one thing I remember. It's like, does it feel like this is happening? And I was like, of course it does. But for other people, it does not feel that way. So, you know, I, my ability yeah. to cry at, I can, you know, walk into it. I can watch two minutes of like the last 15 minutes of a show and I can just start to cry because there's something yeah, sad happening. Me too. I can watch I like a absorbed. Geico commercial and cry. Yes. Yeah. What is that? Absorption. Absorption. Um, my or wife. Or maybe not. They, they can, uh, they can call and correct me and say, you were really misremembering that conversation from 2004. Yeah. Well, that's fine. You know, we just make truth up as we go now in our society, I think. So we're fine. Uh, my wife was watching a show. I should remember it because that would make this story more interesting. Uh, we were we were watching the show and I was just it made me feel so yucky that I had to stop. And I'm not the kind of person who stops, but I was just I think I was absorbed. I think that's the word I'm looking for. Yes. <laughs> Uh, what are you doing in the evenings then if you're not watching your favorite show? Are you listening to something? Are you actually talking to your uh, kiddo and your spouse or what are you yeah. doing? I'm, I could tell you specifically because, uh, oh, that's what I forgot. The best of both worlds is the Tuesday podcast, which is about enjoying parenting and your life. And Laura Vanderkam mm. is a time management person has, is doing a time tracking challenge this week. So I could tell you what I'm doing in the evenings. You know, it's usually some dinner and then some, yeah, some family times. Sometimes we might play a card game or work on homework. Um, but then we have, you know, she's fifth grader and they recommend a half an hour of reading every night. So, you know, by 830, it's reading time and then tuck in and then I go to bed because I need to sleep a good seven or so hours and I'm an aggressive morning person and I like to have time before I work out to have coffee and do the New York Times crossword puzzle using yep. auto check. So it's not too difficult. I'm not interested in uh, exhausting my brain. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I've got lights out between 930 and 10 almost okay. always. 
and you're up at. So there isn't a lot of evening, I guess I would say. Certainly not evening without a, a child around. What time are you up? Um, I set an alarm between five and five thirty usually. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. that's reasonable for yeah. for me. I love I love aggressive mornings. That's good. Aggressive yes. mornings. Yeah. I want to be up Let's before everybody morning. else. Yeah. Uh I find myself like my new thing in the morning. You'll love this. Uh do you know Henry Nowen? The author? No. Uh Yale. Uh, he's he's passed now. He's uh, Yale Divinity uh professor. He was a priest. Um anyway, he wrote so many good books, but I've been listening to his books and uh I was just challenged to like find these. I'm very bad at mindfulness, by the way. So I've been sitting in the dark for like the first 20 minutes of my morning, just in silence with nothing, just Wait, sitting. For 20 minutes? Yeah. I just sit. a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. Just fight thoughts. Just fight, 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 fight. <laughs> but I don't think you're supposed to fight them in mindfulness, right? You're supposed um, to acknowledge no, them and allow them to go I back. do. I, let, I allow them to come up. Yeah. But I'm just saying that they come. They do come. They well, do of course come. they do because you're sitting there. You're yeah. an intellectually stimulated person. So of course they're coming. Yeah. Yeah. But I love the practice. I think it's so good. It's, I think it's just such a, everything else is loud in my world. I've got headphones in most of the time. Um, you know, there are just very, there are rare moments. I, I guess sleep is when I'm quiet. So, or when I'm not listening or take consuming something. So I love this uh, as a spiritual practice. I think it's like, um, I think it's good. Uh, it's obviously cross-cultural, you know, people like all kinds of uh, groups have meditation practices and stuff like that. So I am not, I, I, I recently took the big five again. I was like, surely mm. I, I know that I am now introverted. I know that I've grown, um, you know, I'm changed now. I'm a different person. I like myself. I like my own company a little bit more as I've gotten older, took it full on extrovert still full just, on. yeah, pop my balloon. <laughs> so, so this is good for me. It's good to balance me. <laughs> it is good. It is. That is. Wow. 20 minutes. Yeah. I have a, I like lists. So one of my goals for 2022 is to meditate for at least 2.2 minutes, 22 days a month. So not like one tenth of your, Oh, you know what? Your goal. I, uh, I think if you do that, I'll give you an A, you meet that outcome. Yeah. You know? See, exactly. It doesn't Check. have to be perfect. No, no. <laughs> um, all right. Well, okay. So that's your podcast schedule. That's fantastic. Um, what has it been like to to talk to so many instructors about um, topics that you find interesting? And um, so let me just lead with that for for ask ask Psych sessions. What what's that been like? I mean, it feels like a gift, right? It's like an extrovert's dream to get to meet so many new to me people that are doing really good, important work and let that work be known by more people than, you know, the people in their department or the students in their classes. And it's been good kind of personally, professionally, just to sort of think, to just hear things that I would not intersect otherwise, because they're just not part of what I do, what I read, how I was trained. Yep. Right? So, you know, Christina uh, Zebeda was just on and, you know, talking about motivation, which I'd kind of gotten a sense and I'd heard her give a talk like, you know, we can talk about testing effects all day, but students have to choose to self-test. So we need that piece first, right? I never took a motivation class as an undergrad. I don't teach our motivation class. Yep. Um, so yeah. places like that, it just, it opens up information that I might not have seen. And that is, I think, often, you know, important, important for my students um, in terms of them having a better experience. So I think yep. that's what's been really great about it. And then sometimes being able to make connections across that, right? Like someone will say like, oh, I kind of have this thing, question about this. I was like, oh, well, I think you should meet so-and-so because yeah. they, I yeah. just talked to them about this. Yeah. A connector. You're, you're, I, you're becoming a oh, connector. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm for sure connected. That's your happy place, right? Yes. Is connecting yes. people. Yes. Um, okay. So sometimes I forget, but uh, did you interview Clemente Diaz? I did not. Okay. I, that was for some... IO psychology, yeah. right? IO yeah. psychologist. I yeah, interviewed yeah. Derek Avery. Okay. 
Okay. So it was somebody else. I guess maybe it was, I think it was Janet Peters who was telling me about it. Uh, oh, did yeah. you interview Valerie Jones Taylor? Twice. She came nah, on for the original right. EDI series and then came back to talk about what to do when you get pushback, either uh-huh. from your students or from your colleagues about trying to move your class all right Let, that we'll, we'll, well we'll play the the future game which is uh well thanks for making that introduction because a couple weeks ago i interviewed her uh long form because i recognized her name because you interviewed her and it was fantastic it was so yeah. we did a long form oh yeah. i cannot wait to listen i know i know so i really appreciate that you have found these people how are you finding them uh so s- just sometimes it's the STP page. They make comments. Sometimes when I have a specific question that I want to answer, like when someone wrote in to ask about IO psychology, like I went to the um, APA division that did IO psychology and sort of looked at who was on their board and who was doing what. And I cold email them. Uh, the, a future episode is going to be from someone that wrote, uh, I get a weekly newsletter and she had been the guest essayist for that. Um, sometimes people have come back to me. So uh Jasmine Mina, uh, who was on a couple months ago, she went and heard someone talk and was like, oh, I think this person would be good. So I emailed them. Um, so lots of. So lots she of just, ways. by the way, I've just had the uh, opportunity to work with Jasmine uh, in th- this last year, which was fantastic. Uh, but she knew what you do. And then she reached back out to you and said, hey, you might want to think about this person. Yeah, she'd just been a guest and we'd sort of talked about like my, you know, overall goals for the podcast and how I ended up because uh, I had heard her speak at the uh, decolonizing psychology conference that uh, Columbia Teachers College, I want to say, put on. Um, so, yes, then she said, oh, I just heard this other person talk since it sounds like you are trying to, you know, pick people to be on the podcast. Maybe maybe get in touch. Oh, that's great. And I keep. You know, in terms of if people are like, how do you organize? I use a Trello board. So I keep like future guest ideas. I've emailed them. I'm waiting. There are people that want me to follow up later. Um, and so that's how I sort of keep track of who I'm keeping my eye on. Yeah. Lots of organization options out there, but Trello's yours, huh? For that uh, kind of thing. Just because I started it, right? I'm a big believer in good enough, right? Trello is working good enough. So I'm not going to try to find some do, optimized do you system. Use it? Do you use it in other areas too? I do like I have like where I just sort of I like have like a generic life board where it's like, you know, like keeping just like things that I don't want to lose track of. Um, So, for example, I'm on a I'm on a board and months and months ago, someone said, here's the person you're going to need when you need payments made. But I didn't have any payments coming for the future. So I like put that information on that board. So yeah. that when I needed it to find it, because if you just, you know, sometimes I find that the Outlook search or the Google search, if it's not a distinctive enough word, it's not going to give me what I need. So right. I use it for things like that. I've tried to use it when I've had TAs in a class to kind of do class structure organizing, but I did not find it helpful. But I mean, other people use that as just like their full on project management. Yep. I haven't gotten to that level. I have a problem. I cannot... You know what my strategy is right now? I go through, like, I keep things that I need to get done in email, like in my inbox. So those work their way out over time. Um, But so that's at any given time, it's at 10 because it could be something that is coming up. It just hasn't happened yet. And Mm -hmm. so, but I know, so that is one strategy. My other one, it works. I just don't think it's great. Uh, It's a Word document and uh, it's called To Do. And... um, and it's just a large, large list of stuff to do. Um, and then the things that are really important get get pushed. I kind of move them to the top of it, which I guess is fine. But I've tried Trello and and um, uh, probably a couple other things, Evernote, and um, and I just can't stick with them. And I don't know why. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, I think we could probably talk for a long time and get to the bottom of this, but I would say if you're not forgetting to do important things, then the to-do list is fine. Like I use a Google Doc every week that I just put the date and then I just divide it into teaching, research, service, other, and I just put down the things that have to happen. And then I highlight them when I did them. And then when they don't get done that week, I copy and paste them up to the next week. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Cause now you have a record of those weeks too, in case you have to write like a, yeah, a review or something, right? 
Yes. yes I mean, I, a, yeah. a report, a review. Right. A report. Right. Or if it's yeah. like, when did that thing happen? Yeah. I can, I can do a search. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So that's how you organize. How are, so you're organizing on using Google Docs basically, but why are you using Trello for psych sessions? Because I liked that I could put up the different cards with the different kind of spaces. So okay. I can have like the, you know, done recording, check back in, ideas for the future. Okay. Just, you know, any kind of other thoughts. And you can just drag those cards. Happened. And I can between... move the cards around. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, you said that uh, when Jasmine reached back out to you, she said um, that you were telling her kind of what your goals were, what the what the podcast was kind of all about. What, what has it become for you? And um, obviously, from the time you started... I can't remember exactly when you started, but like there was a pandemic, there's, um, you know, these cultural movements that have been going on. Um, and I, I suspect from your the choices of interviewees and content and stuff like that, that some of that's worked its way in, but I'll, I'll let you uh, answer, which is, and, and the question is, what is, what is the goal for ask, ask psych sessions? Yeah, I mean, I think a, a primary goal is to make sure that I am highlighting voices from people whose identities have been historically excluded in psychology. Um, and I haven't, you know, fully read the apology that APA put out, but I think that it was pretty transparent that there's yep. a, a history of racism in the field. Um, so that sort of like, there's that piece. Like, who am who am I giving? Uh, whose voice is being heard? And then the content. So when possible, when people, uh, you know, I think that the, at least for me, what some of this work has made me realize is almost any topic you're talking about, whether you directly address equity, diversity, or inclusion, equity, diversity, and inclusion is impacting what you're doing in all of your teaching. So bringing that to the forefront um, has been important and looking at ways, you know, that how it can kind of, it, it pops in maybe you know, like one of the things I like about specs grading is I think if it's done well, it can be more inclusive, you know, for students that need more time or space or um, just, you know, some people, they just don't learn things as fast, right? So why, I mean, other than the labor of the faculty member to them to have to do some regrading, but if my goal for a methods class, which I think is really essential for a psychology major, which we could talk about that maybe my obsession with research methods is a sign that I have not fully embraced diversity, equity, inclusion either, right? Because it's a can be, um, it can, you know, it, that way of knowing as being overly superior maybe isn't ideal either. Um, so I think that that's, you know, it, it's really changed the way that I am thinking right, about how I teach and about whom my students are hearing about. So I think that's been um, one big goal. And I, I hope also it's just that people get the sense that, you know, they can't do everything. And so it's really important to figure out what authentically works well for you yeah. on any, you know, any kind of topic. Yeah. And I assume anyone that's listening to this podcast, like wants to be a, a more effective teacher <laughs> otherwise why would you spend your minutes listening about teaching right right well okay so tell me uh when if if i was doing ask psych sessions um it would probably be re um really like the the perspective that i would be asking these questions from would be really my perspective, my classroom, but I do sense that you are thinking more broadly about other instructors when you interview folks, that it's, uh, it's not, you're not just kind of projecting yourself into what they're doing, even though you're benefiting for sure. Right. Um, from the expertise of people that you're talking to, but how are you thinking about the audience when you're asking these questions? Yeah, I do try to think that people have, when you think about all the ways there are to be teaching a psychology course, it's everything from the very niche, tiny seminar style, selective liberal arts, you know, eight highly invested students to a thousand people in a lecture hall in a, you know, a state university. Um, 
And so I do try to also bring on guests that have various teaching experiences in that. Um, you know, we had an, uh, a guest uh, that taught many hundred people in an asynchronous online class. Right? Like how do you how do you manage that? Um, and I think that is just I think that's just a function of my personality that I just think about people all the time. And when I think about people, I think about those those factors about them. Um, there's a term on the Happier in uh, Hollywood podcast about being clutter blind, like you don't notice the clutter around you. Like I, I have a little bit of clutter blind for stuff, but I do don't I don't think like I have a people blind, right? Like that's yeah, like what other people might consider that might be clutter for other people. Those details, like I don't think of that as clutter, right? I think of that as like what makes people interesting and their experiences, and so it's important to me that they're that I'm that I'm being uh, taking that into account when yeah. I'm thinking about the content that I push out. Yeah. You're absorbed. I'm highly absorbed. Yeah. <laughs> no, it definitely comes through. It's uh, really, I, I feel like it is accessible to a wide audience uh, the way that you've, you've done it. Uh, I, I didn't give you any of these questions ahead of time, but I'm now just mm-hmm. asking kind of as a friend, but uh, what, what have you, what have you learned about the skill of kind of interviewing over the, how long have you been at this now? This ask psych sessions thing. Uh, like a year and a half. Okay. I want to say. Like, has um, anything changed from the beginning to the, to, to now? As far I as mean, the I'm way you approached it? Definitely less nervous. Uh-huh. Um, like worried about how it's going to go. Cause I found uh-huh. that usually people that are willing to come on the podcast, they're also pretty go with the flow and, you know, I've gotten better about kind of sending a kind of preview, like here's what I think I'll do. You know, we'll talk, you'll introduce yourself and then here's the the main question. And then I usually use that to ask a sub question. And then I often give a chance for you to talk about something, which please don't tell me what it is in advance. Cause I think that's kind of fun to be yeah. surprised about what the result is. Um, so I think, you know, much like having more specific instructions for students, I think it's been better to give specific instructions to my guests I think that's one place where I feel like I've um, noticed some changes. And then that, that's probably the big one. I, w- I would have to think about yeah, yeah. Other, other pieces. Yeah. Maybe do a qualitative analysis. Yeah. Um, so you have folks lined up at this point, I'm sure. And you have people in your Trello board that you're thinking about. Uh, and... Um, when you look back, uh, so in my head, I just went from the future to the back <laughs> to looking back. But when you when you look back, uh, are there any, not your favorites, not any that were better than others, nothing like that. But just personally, were there any that really changed the way that you kind of thought about yourself or teaching or kind of like you, you look back on you say that was a really important conversation for me or for my audience, any particular episodes that we could kind of guide people towards? Yeah, I'll pick two. Okay. Um, that came to my came to mind first. Um, so one was what ended up being the first EDI talk with uh, Dr. Stacy DeFridis, um, which we had already signed up before we decided to make a series. And what she encouraged me to do in my methods class, because I was already having students read articles about bias and racism, but they were pretty much exclusively comparing you know the experiences of, of black and um, white college students she said you need to make sure that you're reading things that speak to the identities in your classroom and so well this will be the third semester now because um, yeah we had that talk in the summer and then I went sabbatical so when I came back I started surveying my students and asking them what do you want to read about and what's important to you and using a much broader lens of uh, thinking about inclusivity and the student responses to that have been really telling about how beneficial that was. And the most, you know, recency effect, the last article we read last semester is a comparison of, I'm going to lose the second term, uh, it's bilingualism research. And basically, did you learn your two languages together or um, one after the other? And the degree that predicts the degree to which you do cultural blending of those two languages, right? If these are both part of your of your heritage as opposed to, you know, if I just went to learn a language that isn't part of my of, of my culture. 
um, so many students, because what they write in the beginning of these journal responses is about their experience reading. They said, it was so great to read an article that I can so clearly relate to because I am this kind of bilingual or wow, this helped me understand my parent who was this kind of bilingual because they moved when they were this age and learned English second. And, you know, I can see the way that I can, you know, blend my, you know, Puerto Rican and whatever we call New Jersey and <laughs> culture uh, <laughs> together. Um, right. Recognizing that Puerto Ricans are United States citizens as well. Uh, so that, I mean, I, I sent, I sent her an, an email after that, after I graded those and just said, you know, thanks so much because it, you know, it's like one of those blind spots doesn't occur, you know, doesn't occur and, mm-hmm. and made a difference for students. So that one, very important. The second one was, um, when I uh, spoke to Krista, and I'm going to lose um, G-R-E-W-E-S from Utah State University about um, lab research and having it be a virtual experience and how that can be so much more inclusive for students, um, either that have you know, family responsibilities uh, mobility uh, disabilities, you know, so they could not, you know, physically get in and out of a laboratory, chronic health issues. Um, and so as we've been in my department talking about our um, re- requirement of experience for students, trying to make sure that that is uh, in- as inclusive as it can be. So I think those were two that it's like, I can feel myself in a meeting being like, oh, I think we need to talk about this thing that I know about because I interviewed this person. Yeah. And they reminded me that this is important. So I think those were the the two places. And then I just think like broadly, generically, you know, it's just made me hopefully more sensitive than I was before to the ways that systemic uh, racism and inequality is yeah. playing out places, which I can call out as a full professor, friendly Midwestern white lady. Yeah, probably more so than some of my colleagues. Sure, sure. Uh, well, I've seen you kind of dive into this. And and if you were like me, uh, you were probably not very sure of how to educate yourself about all these things. There's a lot of difficulty, um, you know, at the beginning, the beginning, I don't know how to say this. But uh, anyway, what I want to say is it's just evident that you have been personally committed to this and that it has been very helpful for us to go along on the on the journey with you. I'm sure you've had to encounter a lot of your own blind spots or, uh, you know, not knowing how to say something in uh, like a, 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 an inclusive way or maybe catching yourself saying things and saying, oh, I don't know, that's not right. But anyway, it takes... Um, yeah, it does take some courage to be able to kind of get into these conversations as a uh, even as a uh, a white lady from the Midwest, <laughs> and um, and so I just want to say that it's been uh, it's been it's been helpful to listen as a white guy uh, from the Northwest. Um, it's been helpful to listen to these things, and I'm so happy that uh, that we are hearing these voices. Uh, it's uh, yeah. It's good. It's really good. I mean, just to sort of add on to that, I think that that's one other thing that I sort of shifted is I've just become very kind of transparent about it too. When I set up interviews and I, and I say, you know, if you look at the archives, you'll see, I talk about this stuff. That's not the topic that you're here for. I welcome you. If you want to talk about this, if it comes up, fantastic, but I don't require it. So I I think that I've also just become a lot more comfortable. I mean, I think that you know, part of what inspired it originally, just to throw the compliment back to you, is you had a long form interview with Loretta McGregor, um, and she kind of talked about uh, in, that sometimes there was a lack of inclusivity in um, in our in our field. Maybe I can't remember if she was talking specifically about STP or not. STP, I think, yeah, but in yeah. the field, yeah, yeah, in the field. And so, you know, that sort of felt like okay, well, if that exists, I'm sure that's not a unique experience. What can I be doing to try to not perpetuate that? Right? How can I not be creating a cool kids lunch table with my podcast? Yeah. But how can I be making an arena or a maybe not an arena that's a lot more than fifty episodes, but you know, not a. Uh, <laughs> it's not nothing. It's not nothing. Yeah. Uh, it, it is interesting to hear somebody's perspective like Loretta's, which is um, 
so many of us have had such a great experience in STP. It's so inclusive. It's so not like maybe like like non-teaching psychology circles, right? Or whatever academic circles. Uh, and we we sing the praises of, uh, you know, how easy it is to get involved and, and you know, uh, but we shouldn't forget uh, that that is not everybody's uh, experience, even with a great organization. And so I'm glad, you know, and our organizations, APA, STP, they're taking uh, good steps, at least um, public, like public acknowledgement sorts of steps that hopefully turn into real action. So that's good. Um, Marianne, I, uh, I have to jump out to a meeting soon, but, um, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you, you want to talk about? I know that. Well, yeah, I was ahead. just going to say one more pandemic shift, which is that, you know, in the beginning I was very rigid about having content for every other week, but I think that, you know, also thinking about issues of inclusivity, I've become a lot more relaxed, right? People say, I don't have time now. I have time in, in months from now. So that's why you aren't hearing episodes every other week as uh, guaranteed as they were before, because I've sort of decided that I would rather kind of wait for people to be ready and to have time. That said, if listeners want to submit some more questions, um, because a lot of what I've been doing has been just based on my own interests or things I noticed that I think would be helpful. So you can either you can get some more questions or suggest some guests. But I did want to say that this a shift that I've made in the pandemic is this not needing to um, be so rigid and aggressive, right? There's tons and tons and tons of podcasts um, and tons of back catalogs. So yeah. I just wanted to really be honest that I'm someone that's been, you know, trying to be, uh, again, more deliberate and, and conscientious there. Well, I'm, I'm excited now when there is something interesting that happens when they don't come out so regularly. It's kind of exciting to see one pop up, right? It really is. Um, uh, but to that point, I was going to ask you, oh, uh, where do folks send in questions? Do you know off the top of your head? I can't remember our bitly address, but we'll put it in the show notes. It's in the right. show notes, folks. All right. And I, I will not give you the wrong address right i think it's uh hold on hold on hold on i think it's bitly uh, back or forward slash uh, ask, ask psych psych sessions. Sessions. i think so ask yeah oh gosh um by the way do you know the difference between a uh a forward slash and a backslash no i've been saying backslash forever and their forward slashes generally so oh yes because the it's under the the question mark so, but I suppose that one above the enter key that I'm looking at right now would technically be the backslash. Uh, yes. So this is, we, I was correct, bit.ly forward slash ask psych sessions, all lowercase. And then uh, what it, the, the question on that form is, what questions do you have related to teaching? Or what would you like to hear seasoned instructors address in a conversation? Is that fair enough? That's definitely fair enough. Okay. Okay. So um, I guess I do have a question, Marianne, because we know that people are listening to Ask Psych Sessions. We get the numbers. What is it? Why? Uh, and maybe this is a back channel conversation probably, but let's just do it publicly. Why don't we get more engagement? Why? Because people definitely have questions. Do people... Yeah. Why, why don't we have people submitting lots of questions? Because um, if not, Marianne and I have a million questions. <laughs> so, but what do so you think? I think? One thing is people can use the STP Facebook page to get like sort of instant answers, right? So if you have a pressing question, you need to know like, what article should I assign uh, about this topic where my students always get stuck? Waiting for an interview to come out is not the most... Yeah, uh, just in matter. time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, you know, I think that um, I think that some people just they're like, oh, well, I'll just listen to whatever ends up on there, and that's and that's fine. Um, so yeah, I'm not. Yeah, those are my off the cuff. The website works. People have submitted questions, so I well, don't and I'll tell you why the um, uh, yes, yes, and people do submit questions, but I will, I'll tell you why it's really important, listener, that we get your questions is because one of Marianne's values, obviously, is uh, hearing from the community and representing the community uh, and so uh, of, of, of psychologists out there and teachers of psychology. So 
um, to have your questions and your perspectives is really important to uh, what we're trying to accomplish here through Ask Psych Sessions. How was that for an answer? I think that's a great answer. Yeah. I mean, my, right, I'm, I am self-aware that I have a, when I look at the curriculum, right, I teach a very narrow part of mm. the full field yeah. of psychology. So I am sure that there are things that are not being addressed that I don't know are not yeah. being addressed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Marianne, uh, thank you. Marianne Lloyd, by the way, from Seton Hall University uh, in New Jersey, in Princeton? No, north. No. North, next to Newark. What's it called? What's the city? Uh, south Orange. Oh, South Orange. Oh, that's right. All right. Yeah. I'm not going to edit that. Um, no, no, it's fine. I mean, it's it's a state that's like two and a half hours long. We don't really have to be so mad about Princeton. It's like how I feel very sensitive when people confuse Cincinnati and Cleveland. Like, I really can't blame them. Right, there right. Two cities in Ohio that are pretty large and start with the letter C and have football teams like with orange helmets. It's not... <laughs> Should really relax. Uh, hey, friend, am I going to see you at EPA? You betcha. Oh, is that is that right? Are you going to go anywhere else this uh, this year? Any other travel in your future? Maybe the main APA conference in Minneapolis. Okay. okay. Um, maybe ACT in October. Hopefully, yeah. Psychonomics will be back in action in November. Uh, yeah, you don't teach at a Catholic university, so I won't see you at Collegium this summer. So that's my... Gosh. But I really want to go, whatever that is, because I'm an extrovert. It's, oh my gosh, you would what? love it, girl. <laughs> I'm coming. I'm coming. What is it? <laughs> it's a week of faculty development for people at uh, Catholic universities yeah. and colleges. Yeah. You had me at event. Right. A week. Yeah. A, a week, week somewhere event. where someone has planned oh all of your meals and what to do all day, oh. every day. Yeah. Your decision fatigue will be washed away. <sighs> Well, Marion, I trust you are still running uh, long distances slowly and taking good Absolutely. care of yourself. Um, yeah. It was so nice to chat with you again. We are, uh, on, on behalf of uh, Eric and myself and all the listeners, we really just appreciate what you are doing with Ask Psych Sessions, uh, the voices that you are bringing to the family. And um, you're really leading. Honest, honestly, you are. And, and folks in the background as well, Marianne is leading um, Psych Sessions forward. Um, in the way that we think about EDI. And, um, and so I appreciate that, Marianne. Thank you for everything. You are welcome. But I do want to say thank you that I could not do it without all the amazing guests willing to dedicate their time and expertise. So totally huge, huge, huge thanks to everyone that, that has said yes. Yep. Yep. All right, uh, listeners, thank you. And uh, Marianne, again, we appreciate you. And thanks again. Mm-hmm.